sound check. Just put in the in the uh, question box if you can hear us all right. This is um, this is the the new company, uh, Jim Dalton Trading. This is January twenty third, two thousand and eighteen. Trading biases and ideas for dealing with them. I'd like to start by introducing you uh, to one of my partners, and it is. Uh, Jen or Jennifer Lowe. Uh, Jen is one of the people that you will interface or is the person you will interface with most often. Uh, she is really the brains behind the, the whole thing because I don't know a lot of these things. So let me let me start by turning this over to uh, to Jennifer to get us underway. Hi everybody, I'm Jennifer. Um... Just a few housekeeping reminders. I uh, just want to make sure that everybody is aware that this is a new company and that we launched a brand new website. Uh, we did get some um, some emails stating that they couldn't find where the information of our new programs were at and some people were trying to sign up and they were going to the old website. Also, uh, just want to make sure that you get all of our emails and invites. So please be sure to whitelist us in your email in, in email inboxes and your address books. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Jim. This is just for the for all the general emails that most people have in case you don't know how to whitelist us. Uh, I realize that you may not be able to have enough time here to read um, what pertains to the type of email account that you have. However, these slides are going to be available with the court recording later on, so you'll be able to uh, see the slides and the instructions later on at your convenience. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to you, Jim, to talk about the markets. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start um, with the markets a bit, uh, just because it was a was a very interesting day from an educational standpoint. One of the things that we have written about very often is that it is very rare when a, an auction top occurs in the over-the-counter uh, time, or meaning overnight or during an electronic session. Early this morning, during A period, the market rallied up and it was short of the overnight high. There's the overnight high, the red line. There is the A period high. The market broke in A period, very quickly, we got an inside bar in B period, and then the market in C period rallied back up and took out the overnight high. Now, there's a couple things in here. Um, we talk about, about biases. One of the biggest bias that people have is the price bias. Uh, following price. One of the things that was very helpful today, when this market broke, and it broke, it broke very hard, and it was easy to think, wow, is there something more to this? Then B period opened, and B period tried several times to take out the A period low. B period was an inside bar. One of the things that we teach all the time and it is whether you're looking at very long-term trades or you're a very short-term trader, the two most important concepts we ever deal with are balance and excess. B period was an inside bar. As a short-term trader, when C period comes out of B period, that is a very legitimate short-term trade. The market was balanced, it came out of balance. Now, there's some other reasons for taking that trade. The market pushed pretty hard trying to take out the A period low. It was unable to do that. Next, value is way down here. This is the top of value. And for those that are familiar with us, 
you know we trade value, not price. And for those that are new, we trade value, not price. So it's the odds, and we always want to be able to think in terms of odds. The odds were that when B period did not take out A period, the odds were that value was going to be higher today. So one point for going long when uh, when C period came out of B period was that B period did not take out the A period low. So we have an excess low. Two, value looked like it had very good odds of being higher today. And three was that the overnight high had not been taken out in A period. So the market did come back up in C period and take out the overnight high. Okay, what I want to do, and we're going to come to biases in just a minute, but what I want to do, I want to stop right where we are right now, and let me take just a couple of questions, Jennifer, on only what I have talked about so far. Uh, no questions yet for that. No questions? Are there, okay. Well, actually, hold on. Um, I think they're referring to, to the tweet that you posted earlier with the diagram, and they're asking, uh, hello, Jim, student for seven years, uh, referencing the tweet auction number four, I think what you had marked as number four on your uh, diagram from your tweet, I saw a market in balance value higher and auction for inventory correction. Why would a odds more meaningful correction exist? Oh, okay. What, what it was when C and D period came up and took out the overnight high and came back in and the market started to work its way lower. Even though value wasn't going to be higher, the fact that the overnight high had been taken out, confidence had not been that high today, that increased the odds that we have a sh at least a short-term high. Now, that high did hold for the remainder of the day. I don't know what's going to happen going forward. But that was the reason for saying the option four is because the overnight high was taken out. The new all-time high had now been made during the uh, pit session hours. So when we came back in, it in the odds increased that we had a short-term top. That doesn't mean the odds were high. It just means the odds had increased. And one of the things we're always trying to do is think in terms of odds. If you can learn to think in terms of odds, that will also help you overcome a lot of the biases. And we're going to talk about in more detail in a, in a few minutes. But thinking in terms of odds is a one way to help you get a better, clearer picture of what your trading opportunities are and Oh, help what you want to do is focus on the market focus on market generated information and that will help the biases go away okay the next thing I want to talk about is that what you have seen in so many afternoons is you've seen the market make these late moves up you had a late move up on the 19th Friday you had a late move up on yesterday and so what happens you get in that in that habit of expecting that now short-term traders do what works until it doesn't work anymore so you can see even late after late this afternoon i period j period k period l period m period they're going up like you're going to go and, and make you know they're playing for that high up there now, again, you can be biased by price. You know, you can say, well, I've seen it every day. But the important piece of information, if you look at the blue line right here, the blue line is half back. The red line is yesterday's high. Notice in C period and G period, the market came down to a single tick of
above yesterday's high. The question I always ask is if the market, if the buyers come in just a tick above yesterday's high, more than likely, who are those buyers? Are they, you know, are they short-term buyers or are they long-term buyers? More than likely, they're short-term buyers because long-term buyers don't even know where that number is. Now, you can turn that on me and you can say, well, you know, yesterday, Jim, um, we had an exact level. The market came in at, if you remember that, and we'll see this again in a few minutes, but I had written down that this was support. And that was the old, because it was the old high the old all-time high. The market did come down. It did not take that support. So it was the perfect the perfect trade. But it wasn't, it, it's still a fairly mechanical trade. But it's not quite the same as what you were looking at today. So the first thing was that C, C period and G period came down to a single tick above yesterday's high. Again, we're talking about talking in terms of odds. So what happened is the buyers came in, but more than likely, those were short-term or daytime frame buyers. Again, longer term, more serious money, they have no idea where that reference is. So when I looked at that, that gave me you know, a better chance that there wasn't anything real on the upside. Even though the market did go up in C and D period, take out that high, take out the overnight high and come back in. When we came down a second time, the odds, in my opinion, were fairly low. Now, if you look at the L period low, the blue line in here is half back. The L period pullback low was a single tick above half back. Again, is that weak buyers or strong buyers? Those are weak buyers. Those are day time frame, shortest term, shortest of, of time frame buyers that were buying at that level. And then you see they tried to take the market up again. And uh, so much of what we talk about in these courses, and for those that have been with me before, what you know is we are always trying to understand the people we are competing against. Are we competing against long-term buyers or are we competing against short-term buyers? So we're competing against short-term buyers. Again, twice, just a tick above yesterday's high, L period low, one tick above a below half back. They try to take the market up and you can see we got a break. Uh, coming into the close, and we're trading off a little bit afterwards. It is this kind of thinking that helps you be competitive in the market, and it helps you it helps you think in terms of odds and lose some of those biases that get in all of our ways. Okay, any couple questions just on what I've talked about too far before I go on the formalized portion of the presentation uh yes um do you let a period close before taking a trade using this as something to lean against i got myself in trouble today by not doing so lesson to carry forward i i elected to let a period close uh and i watched b period and i watched b period you know, very hard trying to take out the A period low. And it was very helpful because I was I was biased to the downside. I wanted the market to break. And I actually had the right trades on when that market broke. And then I watched B period. Now I had to overcome my desire, my bias, what I needed, what I wanted to see, etc when I watched B period and it wasn't there. Two or three times they tried to take this. And then we, you know, then I said before, and I think one, two, three, we weren't gonna get lower value. We uh, had a poor high or we didn't take the overnight high. But in this case, 
in this case, I did wait um, until A period was over. Okay, one or two more questions. Okay, have there any have there been any footprints of longer time frame traders in the last several months? Well, clearly, the market hasn't gone up as high as it's gone up without some participation from the longer time frames. But more than anything else, what I think is going on with the longer time frame, and you know, I, I've talked to a couple of these guys, and you hear them on the on TV. They don't particularly like the market, but you'll hear them say they're just riding the wave, and and I think that's a lot of what's going on. They're letting the shorter term traders, you know, take the market higher. And and don't forget, as I've said many times in the past, you've got your longer term money that you know is in the long only and the big you know the big uh mutual funds for head uh, for uh, uh corporate accounts pension funds things of that nature but there is a tremendous amount of money around the world that is in shorter term pools and these shorter term pools are very highly leveraged so you've got your you've got your day traders which are, you know, basically they they come in flat, they go home flat. They are the weakest of time frames. Beyond that, you have all a couple different kind of time frames, but you have these pools of hugely capitalized uh, money, uh, you know, large pools that then they they levered those those pools. One of the reports I got from a very knowledgeable person was coming into the end of the year. A lot of the hedge funds that are, you know, trading oriented were delevering. So they were, you know, they were getting out, they were lightening up. And then when the new year came around and there was, you know, we took off from day one, then these firms were forced to relever because that's how they make their money. So they were forced back into the marketplace. And, you know, if they're beyond, if, if they're holding less securities than they would normally have, that is the same as you and I being short. So yes, I think there's no question there's been, you know, long-term money. But it and the other th important thing I think, long-term money hasn't done any selling. They're just riding the uh, they're just riding the the wave and I don't blame them. But also this happens quite frequently and you'll hear me say many times that long-term money very often if the markets start down, they don't start liquidating until the market's down maybe 7 8 9% you know, because what, what they say when the market first starts down, they tell their clients, oh, this is very natural. This is very normal. This is actually good for the market. It allows the inventory to get back in balance, and then we're going higher. Well, and then when the market gets down, you know, 7 8 9%, then they, they, they go in the same panic situation we do as short-term traders. They just do it with greater magnitude. So you'll see a lot of times that – you know, when the markets really break, they'll be down seven, eight, nine percent, and then you'll see a much larger swoosh down. Not always, but it's certainly something to look for. Okay, uh, one more question before we move on. Okay, at what time period would you change your downside bias after your tweet about downside bias? Uh, it's not a particular time frame. It's uh, I never changed my bias today. You know, after it made, after it uh, failed um, to carry through, after taking out the uh, overnight high, uh, my bias stayed short um, for the remainder of the of the day, uh, doing short term things on the on the but on the short side rather than on the long side of the market. Now, what we look for is coming into tomorrow. If there's anything here, you know beyond just what happened today, then, you know, we should see lower value tomorrow. So we should, you know, that would give us, we'd have a high made in the over and the daytime frame market. And then if there's anything there, we start to see uh, a lower value, at least overlapping to lower value tomorrow. Now the odds of that aren't real good because the point of control is three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is 12 wide. With a point of control 12 wide, that's called a very prominent point of control. 
you know, so the odds are relatively decent. We get pulled back to that level, but there's an awful lot of uh, long money in this in this market. So you could get you could get um, continued liquidation at any at any time. So we'll watch very closely. But if there's follow through tomorrow, you know, we should see lower value uh, tomorrow. OK, I'm going to switch to the um, slide presentation. Um, OK, I took the definition of a bias right from uh, Wikipedia. Bias means one sided lacking a neutral viewpoint or not having an open mind. Bias can come in many forms and is related to prejudice and intuition. That the last the last point in there, intuition is a, a very important consideration to me. Many of you know um, Brett um, Steenbarger. Uh, Brett and I have known each other for many years. When I first wrote Mind Over Markets, uh, he responded with a 70 or 60, 70 or 80 page um, set of comments that was, you know, just really very, very insightful and helped me tremendously as I moved forward uh, in the market. But the other day, uh, about a month ago, I sent him a, a email in the morning and I said, one of the things that I have been focusing on is the importance of honing intuition. I said, do you think the professional world would attack me for that? He came back. He said, it's absolutely a wonderful term and absolutely not. They would have no, I forget the exact words, but he thought it was a, it was a great idea. And, and that's what I had been talking with. So honing intuition is one of the main focuses of our mind over markets advanced intensive that's coming up here starting the, uh, I believe it's the 26th of February. And, and let me speak a little bit about intuition. If I've made the statement a lot of times, if I said to somebody, you know, you could, you're a pretty good trader, you got pretty good intuition. They would smile from ear to ear. They would think, boy, this is a pretty nice compliment. The chances are, that most people that think they're intuitive traders uh, really aren't because they really don't understand what it means to hone intuition. In the past, I've used some simple examples to talk about intuition. Talked about, you know, if you're, uh, you, you're riding on the back of somebody's motorcycle, the guy driving or the person driving the motorcycle, you know, they just kind of naturally learn to lean into the turn. You're on the back of the motorcycle. Uh, you're uh, you're trying to, to sit up straight. So your intuition is misleading. And a lot of times your intuition will mislead you. The other example I tell is the first time I ever went water skiing uh, off of a, off of a jump. And they told me that, you know, when you you go from uh, flat water to water up a, um, a ramp, with water pulling down it, that there's less friction there is on flat water. Well, you know, I heard all that, but I really didn't believe it. And of course, I mean, I thought I believed it, but when I went off, I naturally leaned back. And of course, there I was bouncing on my back as I hit the water. It only took one time for me to understand that my intuition uh, was wrong in there. But I, I, I read another example of of intuition the other day. Um, I forget the I forget the book I, I was reading, um, but it, it was a couple of FBI agents. Was it red light? A uh, red notice? I mean, no, no, no. Oh, okay. Uh, but it was a um, uh, couple of guys in the. Uh, I, I can't believe that I can't remember the name. They were FBI agents. One of the first uh, FBI agents uh, operations undercover. They did not have have uh, have guns, and it actually uh, that project that they were on uh, that tremendous number of arrests and uh, uh, scams that were 
uh, taken out of existence, but it also was what led to the famous abscam uh, undercover operation that took place in New Jersey that put several congressmen and things in behind behind bars. But one of the things that they were talking about in there, they uh, initially they were meeting mostly with uh, with con men, uh, you know, uh, white collar type of stuff. But then they were into New Jersey and there was going to be some meeting uh, with uh, some pretty tough uh, mafia people. Well, you know, they were somewhat concerned because if they were found out, they didn't have guns and they are, you know, they were wearing wires and, you know, that possibility that their life could end. Well, what they were talking about, they were concerned that they didn't have weapons uh, and they were going this on their own, even there were, even though there were agents trying to monitor them from outside. But things that caught my attention is what they were practicing one night. When somebody pulls a gun on you, your first instinct or intuition is to back away. And and I remember this from some of the training I had years ago. When somebody pulls a gun on you, uh, if you're going to disarm them, your first move has to be into them and and take and break the and break the wrist. Well, they were practicing that the they the two of them were practicing that over and over at night in their hotel room, you know, honing their intuition. So if somebody did pull a gun on them, their first instinct wasn't to move away. The hone after the intuition was was honed that they would move into into the person and attempt to disarm them before they got shot. So they, what I can say, honing intuition is going to be one of the main focuses of this advanced uh, intensity that we're going to be holding. Okay, here's the the first real life example. And we're going to go to something away from real life in a, in a moment here. But this is yesterday. And uh, it's somewhat embarrassing to me. But if when we teach these courses, if I don't give you everything and make it honest, uh, then it's not going to have real value. And like I say, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this. I had a bias towards price, you know. So one of the biases was was just price too high, and my so my intuition, my intuition was telling me not to take the trade. Even though, if you look at what I wrote, even though what I wrote was perfect. And the market came exactly down to the reference within a tick of what I wrote, was in a tick of what I delivered uh, to all of you. But yet I was carrying, I was carrying this bias. And so when my intuition was telling me, I did not take the trade. Now, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to another example. And I'm going to show you something that ties into this, another bias that ties into this. But first of all, let's take this and talk about how, if, if, what should I have done that I didn't do? I should have, I should have had, I should have had a buy stop in above this reference. With a, if that, once that stop was hit, that it elect the sell order down below the reference. That's what I should have done because all the trends are up. All the trends are up. The market's been very, very strong. And I, of course, knew that there was a good chance that they would, you know, the market would rally after the uh, uh, after they got the government reopened. But the truth is I, I didn't do it. Um, so I had I had a bias. My intuition was was telling me something and that intuition was wrong. But I didn't do anything to oversee or to override that bias. Now, 
What I'm going to show you in here, if you were looking at what I wrote yesterday, yesterday morning, it also introduces another bias. The, one of the things we've written about quite a bit is the very prominent overnight POC. What we wrote is very prominent, and this is clearly a very prominent overnight uh, POC, that the odds are very good that that overnight POC gets revisited fairly early in the day. So now we enter another bias, and this is called a confirmation bias. And a confirmation bias is, you know, you look for something that supports your view. So I had written about this. You can go back and, and see it there. So I saw this very prominent overnight point of control. And I was, if the market got back there, I was, uh, I was thinking maybe I'd get long if it didn't carry through there. But that, that bias from that or that piece of information, well, it was a valid piece of information. And the odds are very high that they get revisited. The odds are at 100%. But what I did is I took one piece of information. I let it confirm the, the overvalued bias that I, that I already had. So my confirmation bias supported my initial bias. So you can get a pretty good idea that I'm not going to do well uh, yesterday. And I, you know, I didn't get on that, that long trade. You know, I got some stuff later on, but I didn't get on that in the morning. So here's two biases. And then we look at the confirmation bias. The, uh, one of the reasons that are going to confirmation bias, let me expand on it more than what I'm talking about right here. One of the things that you will hear me say continually, know when the economic releases are coming. Or if you're a crude oil trader, know when, you know, the reports are coming out. Because you want to be able to trade the market based upon the auction process once that news comes out. You do not want to know what that news is. Once you know what that news is, you're... If the news doesn't support what the market's going to do, you have just built in a confirmation bias. I am amazed that the biggest market that I had when I first started um, teaching, uh, you know, trading was the uh, crude oil traders on the New York Merck long before the market went electronic. But it was amazing how many of the really good traders came to me and said, I'm talking about the super traders, came to me and said, you're right on, Jim. You're absolutely right because it doesn't make any difference. We trade what the market is. We trade what the order flow is giving us afterwards. So I can't say it enough. Don't you, you want to know when the, well, you want to know when the report is coming? whether it be an economic report or whether it be a crude oil report or any other kind of livestock report. But you do not want to know what the actual report is because you are very likely to get a confirmation bias from that. And let's talk about when these reports come out. You got the actual report itself. You've got corrections to the previous report. You've got <clears throat> the whisper numbers that have been going around. And it is very unlikely that any of us have the background to really able to understand that report. Yet, the majority of you will not be able to resist looking at what the numbers from that re report were. When we do webinars and stuff, it's amazing how many people keep keep sending notes in what the report was. And I keep saying, I don't want to know. So anyhow, because, and the reason for it is, it brings confirmation bias. Anchoring. 
anchoring is a psychological heuristic that describes the propensity to rely on the first piece of information encountered when making decisions. You know, one of the examples they give, one of the common examples they give, uh, you're going to buy an automobile. And the first price, the first price you hear from the dealer, I may be grossly high, but that anchors your thinking. And then, you know, you make adjustments from there thinking you're getting a great deal. But usually the adjustments you make are very small adjustments. And you want to be very conscious of the fact of how easy it is for us to, you know, take that first piece of information and rely on it too much. The heuristic, I want to put in what is a heuristic. It's often called, it's simply uh, a technique. It's any approach to problem solving, learning or discovery that employs a practical method not guaranteed to be optimal or perfect, but sufficient for immediate needs. Without, it's a mental, it's a mental shortcut. Without these mental shortcuts, and here's here's where we get trapped. Without these mental shortcuts, you know, we can't get up out of bed in the morning and, you know, go and have breakfast. We can't drive a car. We use these mental shortcuts all the time. And for most of the things we do, they're very efficient. They may not be perfect, but they're very efficient and help us, you know, get around. When it comes to things like trading and other more complicated decisions, they don't work. They can greatly mislead you. You take that first, you take that first answer and you may find that you don't really have a prayer. And one of the one of the ways we get around these, and I tried to show you when we opened the webinar tonight. I tried to show you. One of the things we do to get around this is to focus on market generated information. The market is a continuous two way auction process. And what we're doing is continually looking at those auctions to see what's there. Now you saw in one of the one of the tweets I put out today, I drew the arrows to show you the continuous two-way auction process. Now, let me just go back to the market for a second in here. And during that during that process, one auction, we saw the market go down, but we didn't see it follow through. Next auction, we saw the market go up, take out the overnight high. That was auction two. Auction three, the market came back down, to a single tick above yesterday's high. We had another auction to the high, another auction back down to just two ticks above yesterday's high. We had another auction up, another auction down that started exactly from half back. So again, it's, it's so easy to get opinionated in here about the market's weak, the market's strong or whatever, but if you learn to read and understand the continuous two-way auction process, you will have a fighting chance to keep yourself unbiased and capable of competing with the best in the business when it comes to when it comes to trading. Well, I thought I had from the beginning. Oh, I didn't want to go from the beginning. I'm sorry. Conflict of interest. Um, I mean, is everything is written on conflict of interest. You know, any market guru may be wittingly or unwittingly uh, misleading you. Uh, the guru may also have a strong self-serving bias. So, I mean, it's a conflict of interest. It can be self-serving. Um, and that's why, you know, how do we get away from 
these conflict of interest and people that are, you know, have self-serving motives, motives, or maybe, maybe their motives aren't, maybe they're not bad motives, but maybe they're just wrong. Somebody is bound to determine the market's going down. And no matter what they tell you, no matter what they tell you, it's always oriented towards the downside. And they may sound, they may sound very articulate. One of the stories that I've told practically too many times is years ago, I think it was Goldman Sachs on one side <coughs> talking about their view of the Japanese yen. And there used to be a firm by the name of White Well, which was White Weld, which was a white, you know, white shoe, top of the line, uh, you know, firm. And their presenter came up very articulate talking about why the yen was going just the opposite of the way uh, Goldman presented. I sat there and I listened to these presentations and I was mesmerized by both of them and I knew they were both right. You know, I mean, obviously they weren't both right, but it's so easy to be convinced. And how do you protect yourself from this? And it's important that you know how to read and interpret market generated information on your own. The most honest information we have is in the market. It is the composite of all the buying and sell orders that come in from around the world. Well, you don't see all of those because some of them are hidden in hidden pools and dark pools and stuff. But you get a very good view because even some of those people that are in the dark pools, they do things to hedge. So there's a tremendous amount of information in this market. But for example, for months and months and months, the market's been one time framing higher. No matter what your bias, if you say, well, this is this is too high, it can't go any higher. Well, guess what? There was never any information that said it stopped. The market on a monthly basis, one time framing higher. And this is why I always start out, the first thing I do every day or every night when I do when I do my preparation, I look at the the monthly. I always start from the top down. I look at the monthly, I look at the weekly, I look at the daily to see what is going on. So the monthly's been one time framing higher, the weekly's been one time framing higher. Guess what? The chances that we're going much lower, you know, until that changes are pretty slim. Now, what did I talk about? Let me go back to the market for just a second. So the market on a daily basis, we had one break and the market went a couple ticks below a previous day's low. Since that time, it went back, it's one time framing higher. One time framing means that, you know, this day isn't taking, low isn't taking out this low. One time framing, one time framing, one time framing, One time framing, one time framing hasn't stopped for several days. Why was was I focused on tomorrow? Because the market did break late uh, today. I did think it was heavy all day long. Now, the question is, how do you stay objective? If there's anything there, then at a minimum, we should start to see um, – lower value tomorrow and if there's anything to even think about we should take out today's low taking out today's low does it mean that we have anything on the downside to follow through but it certainly increases the odds so that's what we would start to look at so you know if if the weekly is going to stop one time frame it's going to start with the daily so we look at the daily to see Okay, did it stop one time framing? And if there's going to be a change in the weekly, guess what? You're going to see a change in the daily first. And what I'm really getting at here, what you want to do is you want to get to the point <coughs> where you um, can constantly think for yourself rather than take the advice of somebody else. 
because it's it's so easy for that person to have a conflict of interest. It's so e uh, you know all of us get it wrong. I mean, you look at my early start yesterday. I had it wrong. Okay, we all get it wrong from time to time. And if you're leaning on somebody, it's so easy to be misled by them. And sometimes intentionally, and sometimes not intentionally. Okay. This is this is something that's a little a little deeper to read through here. It's an inductive bias. Inductive bias occurs within the the field of machine learning. I'm sorry, it's going to be a little heavy. In machine learning, one seeks to develop alg algorithms that are able to learn to anticipate a particular output. Boy, we all hear about al uh, algorithms, algorithms all the time. And boy, we think that's the be all and end all. To accomplish this, the learning algorithm is given training classes that show the expected connection. Then the learner is tested with new, with new examples without further assumptions. This problem cannot be solved exactly as unknown situations may not be predictable. The inductive bias of the learning algorithm is a set of assumptions that the learner uses to predict outputs given uh, inputs that it has not encountered. It may bias the learner towards correct solution, the incorrect or be or be correct some uh, or, or be correct some of the time. Um, a classic example is this inductive bias is uh, Occam's razor, which assumes that the simplest cons uh, consistent hy hypothesis is always the best. And the reason I put, I know this is heavy, but the reason I put this in here is, is so many times people want, there's some, we have so much trouble with the psychology uh, and get twisted around ourselves in trading. We, th we always want to think that somebody else has the answer. And we always want to think that they've got an algorithm. And we hear so much about algorithms. If you go back and review the algorithms on Wall Street, you will find there may have been one algorithm that worked. And then that was quickly replaced by an even better algorithm. Um, you know, at least it worked for a period of time under certain market conditions. And I just think it's to the point where you should be very suspect of of people that think they have a machine that is going to make your trading decisions. It sounds nice, but my my point too is if you had an algorithm that truly worked, what you would do, you would sell it to one buyer for an astronomical amount of money. I mean, if I had an algorithm that worked to make money in the market, I'm certainly not going to do uh, webinars like this and all the work that they take, you know, I just sell it to I just sell it to one to one buyer and I you know I go off and retire for life. Anyhow, that's my view, that's my view of it and I've been around and I've seen a lot of these over the years. So, um, let me take some questions. Uh, we've talked a lot about biases. Uh, we haven't even gone into them in any depth. There's just so many biases. I've just tried to open the door to some of them and some of the ones that I face. And But the real answer, I believe, to any bias is market generated, learn to read market generation, generated information. It's the most unbiased information you're going to get. Now, it doesn't tell you where to buy or sell. You have to interpret it, but it is unbiased information. The other thing that I think is very important is that you keep a trading journal. We have a tremendous ability to lie to ourselves. Oh, I'm doing okay. I think if you keep a trading journal, uh, you will find that you may be shocked at you know, what you discover if you record it honestly. Now, I haven't had a chance to go into it in any depth, but there's an individual that sent us a testimonial. He, he's been through several classes with us. He's been trading for 20 years, 
professional trader. He, he took classes with us and then he moved on and he took some additional classes with SMB trading, which is a, a firm that if you trade well, they, I think they will allocate funds to you. But one of the things that uh, Michael suggested I take a look at, and I looked at it briefly, I haven't gone into any depth. It's called Trader View, one, one word. And Trader View, from what I see so far, <coughs> looks like it's a has the possibility of being a very good way to keep a trading diary, to start a trading diary. So I looked at it, it looks like you can you know, have your trades uh, downloaded from your trading platform or even from your own, from your own desktop. But it's, it's the, the reason for a trading journal is to add clarity to what you are doing. It is the easiest thing in the world for us to lie to ourselves. I've done it multiple times. And the most important thing is the clarity and understand what we are really doing. Uh, Jen, let's take some questions. Okay. Um, one person was asking, would you mind canvassing the outline and approach we will be taking in the new intensive, the workflow, et cetera? Uh, the, number one, it's an immersive course, meaning that there is no nice printed PDF lesson plan because we are dealing with the market every day as the day itself happens and unfolds. You saw me discuss today. It's very seldom that you see two, two days that are even that similar. I will do a, a market uh, recap at the, or a daily report at the end of each day. And then I will have a morning report that will update uh, the market after we see what the overnight activity is and what's going on early to, to have you, you know, well prepared. Then throughout the trading session, uh, there's a one-way chat function so that I can constantly put chats, comments to your screen. And the importance of it being one way is a lot of traders really don't want to look at all the different comments and, you know, things that go back and forth. You can get lost in what it is. So all the comments will be comments coming from, from me and things that I see in the market. Important, which is a huge change, is Jen, who you've now been introduced to. Jen is going to do a short video recap of each day and provide that for you. Uh, and those then will be recorded for you to go back and look at. But you'll get that each day. Uh, you know, we're not sure how well this is going to work because we haven't done it yet. But that is, you know, what will be there. Now, what's important is that we don't have, we don't have this set mechanical program. We go with the market. We're immersed in the market and the real type of things that go on <coughs> in a market. And this is why it is it is so important. Uh, the story that I tell that some of you know is when I first started teaching, uh, it was done in an organized uh, form, linear presentation from charts and graphs, etc. And people said, Oh, I, I, they like that because it felt nice and neat. I was extremely unsatisfied with it because it really didn't <coughs> tuck you in to give you the real feel of the market. Then I went to teaching on in a, in a uh, conference room or a hotel, you know, a big hotel on a podium, uh, you know, on a stage with a podium for, you know, it would be four to five days. Uh, that was a great improvement. And we got really good remarks really good reviews from that. However, I was still dissatisfied because in five days, number one, you won't see enough different types of days to really expose you to the market. And secondly, you can only retain so much information. The next step suggested by my previous partner was to go to the intensives. And the intensives are, 
you know, they, they each one is about five weeks in length. So that is, you know, that gives me a lot more time than being on the stage. There's in this case, I think there's about a two and a half week in between, and then there's a second intensive. And so if you put them all together, you'll have 10 weeks, two and a half weeks in between. And in between, I, I will continue to do the daily reports and I will continue to do the chats. In the, when the intensive starts, I, I have a, uh, at least each morning, I'm on live with you for the first hour, hour and a half when the market opens. On big news days, I'll be with you live for two hours. So it's a combination of ways to disseminate information from the, the daily reports uh, to the comment, to the chats, to the live, um, you know, presentations in the morning where we're live with you in the immersive, in the immersive markets, uh, to the video recap. So it's trying to disseminate as much information as possible. Uh, this announcement hasn't come out yet, but a lot, a lot of times what we will have is an early sign-up bonus. So that for those that sign up early, um, you know, there's some kind of a benefit. Well, and generally in the past, that benefit has been economical. What came to me not too long ago was the most valuable thing we can ever have is knowledge. Knowledge is far more valuable than some kind of reduced uh, economic cost for the course. So starting February 1st, you want to be signed up by February 1st. If you are, just just to interject, uh, can I'm you sorry. go to the previous previous slide? That way people can see, because that will have the dates on there and everything. Or the slide okay, after there. this one. Yes, this one. Yeah, okay. So the the uh, the intensive uh, starts on the 26th of February, but starting February 1st, <coughs> I am going to uh, do a. Uh, a nightly report and a morning report, and I will do chats throughout the day. So if your chat room is open, um, I will you I will uh, fire chats to you, comments to you throughout the day on your screen as to things that I see in the market. Now there may be a couple of days in there where I got a doctor's appointment or something that I may not be a full day's chat. But the intention to do that is that knowledge is far more valuable than actual money. So for those who get signed up and, and get, uh, you know, with the course, I will start on February 1st uh, with a pretty good amount of information so that by the time we get to February 26th, you've got a pretty good, pretty good background and you've had far more exposure uh, than just the days you'll get in the intensive. Other questions? Yes. So one person was saying, I've taken several of your past courses. Um, is the new course a repeat or follow on from these? The, the, the new course, uh, there will be one of the things that, that I find that I do every time I end one, one course and I'm gone for quite a period of time. Uh, the first time I retired and I went to, uh, I was in Thailand for a while and, uh, did some traveling, and I really thought, I didn't intend to do that, but I really thought about the presentation. Uh, between the last presentation presentation and this one, uh, I spent uh, quite a bit of time studying about Eastern Europe, traveling through Eastern Europe, ending up in, in Bucharest, and, you know, coming back. And each time I do this, I get, I get refreshed, I get fresh thinking, and come back and it, you're always looking at better ways to present. For example, one of the things that's new in this is this whole idea of how do we hone our intuition. I think that's very important. There'll be uh, much more emphasis on keeping you in, in touch with, with the markets, with trends, and with biases. A, a, a good course should have a balance between market understanding and self-understanding. My emphasis this time will be much more on self-understanding and biases and things like that than it has been in the past. And of course, 
uh, I announced a little while ago that Jen is going to be doing a video recap of each day. So again, it gives you a better chance to go back and review the market and, and you know learn from each of those reviews. Okay, another question. Would you recommend this program for people who work full time, not active trading, but want to learn? I'm from the West Coast, and I can be at the computer until I can't be at the computer until 11:30 East Coast time. Okay, let me let me be very straightforward with you. If you can't be, you know, in front of the the, the markets as they trade, then you add at least you ought to focus on looking at intermediate or swing trades and ha having an understanding of what is an intermediate or swing trade and how would you do those trades what sets them up because then if you then get a chance later on to go to day trading uh you will have you will have moved uh forward substantially because if you are once you learn a swing trade you got a pretty good idea of the short-term direction of the market. Swing trade may ask, may you know, it may last a few days. It may last, uh, you know, a week or two. But you really want to get into that field. You also want to be able to look at each day, and I think the recap videos will help and the reports will help, so you get an understanding of what went on. Another one of the stories that I tell, um, I had retired from. Uh, uh, several times from UBS Financial Services. Uh, after my wife died, uh, they were having some problems and some big suits in the hedge fund area. They asked me if I would be interested in coming back and working on that problem. Part of the negotiation for that was that they knew that I was a short-term trader and part of the negotiation for that was that I would be uh, limited to the amount of trading that I could do. And the uh, what I was allowed to do, I could make uh, uh, adjustments, maybe one or two a month, to my 401k. So what I did is I came home every night and I treated each day as if I'd been in front of the market, even though I hadn't been and I hadn't traded. Now, the embarrassing part of this story, which unfortunately some of you have heard before, I actually did better with the adjustments I made to my 401k plan than I'd made as a short-term trader previous to that. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. There's a lot of value, no matter what you do, in learning about and understanding markets. When you can't be in front of the markets, then you shouldn't be doing the short-term trades. And to be honest, we do spend more time uh, on short-term trades than anything else because about 85%, 85% of the trades in the marketplace are relatively short-term trades. And only about 15% are really, you know, uh, directional. So I hope that's a fair and honest answer. Additional questions? Yes, yeah, several people are asking about um, will there be options – uh, options webinars. Are you going to be doing a lot of options or webinars on that will include options? Yes, I I, I will do. I, I won't do a lot of option option webinars uh, because my I will do some right at the start, uh, particularly because to introduce you to how I use options. But I don't use for those that may be familiar. I don't use any of the uh, the computer generated, you know, numbers or the, you know, the, the, the Greek numbers. Um, to me, when I use an option, an option is a, it's a way to look at being delta long or delta short. And an option is a substitute purchase or sale of the underlying. So I'm not doing exotic spreads. I'm not doing exotic spreads. I'm not doing bull and bear spreads. Most of the options I do are substitutes for being long or short the future. Now, with that said, it is not uncommon for me if I am long calls, for example, and the market runs, it is not uncommon 
for me to short futures against my light, my long call it calls in some kind of a mix that you know allows me to benefit if the market goes up uh, also would benefit me if the market went down uh, I will do some of that I, I'm I'm doing less and less of that uh, but I do it depends on the market it depends on the conditions in the market if we go back to markets that have you know more trading and less directional moves I, I'm sure I will go back into doing more uh, long futures uh, against the calls and uh, I'm sorry short futures against the calls and long futures against the puts so yes there will be options uh, and I will constantly answer questions on them and I'll do as many programs as you need but just understand I am not traditional I don't use the Greeks um, uh, I, I don't know how many of you know that I was the uh, uh, I was the uh, number two person at the Chicago Board Options Exchange during its early formative years also the uh, uh, the spy uh, originally uh, the spy was my idea it came it, it you know it morphed as time goes on it wasn't originally thought of as a spy it was originally thought of as an index uh, for the stocks that we were trading on the uh, on the CBOE I wanted uh, I wanted something to uh, you know draw attention to what we were doing and another way to look at it but that did evolve into uh, the spy as time goes on so my, my background goes back there but again it's a different view than most of you are accustomed to an additional question or two uh, yes, um, somebody asked, what is the medium of communication? Will it like, be like an open webinar console, like GoToWebinar? And I just wanted to let everybody know that basically once you make a purchase of you know, session one or session two or you do the bundle, you'll get to make an account and then you'll have a user dashboard where you'll, you will find a tab called Live Commentary and you will be able to go and see the live commentary over there uh, on the website So from your login. Uh, another question is, will Jim be telling his trades to students before uh, taking them? No, the answer is no. I mean, do I occasionally, uh, do I occasionally um, talk about something I may be looking at? Yes. But the purpose of this is not to tell you where to buy or where to sell. Just to get that out front so people aren't disappointed. The purpose of this is to help you think for yourself and it doesn't do any good whatsoever and you'll come up with a million reasons why it would help you but trust me you're not going to learn to trade and you're not going to get the confidence in yourself unless you do the trade yourself my goal is to help you think about the market and think about the trades you would like to take but it's not to tell you I'm buying here or selling here that's not the purpose of the course okay thank you and another person was asking, or we've had a few people ask about the old content from the old website. Um, will any of that material be available? And the answer to that is uh, we don't have control over the old websites any longer. So we had made the announcements well, well in advance of when um, it was supposed to be shut down. So unfortunately, um, you won't be able to access that stuff unless you had it downloaded already. And for people who are wondering, will the, their old username and password work on the new site? No, it will not. Yeah. That all was closed down on the end of the, end of the year. Okay. Uh, two more questions. Um, I think that we've covered everything. I wanted to explain to everybody that we do have the NICE back as a resource on the new website. Um, there are no guarantees about whether or not it will get broken again or not. Um, basically, uh, you know, that's we pull from Yahoo, and sometimes that gets broken. You know, Verizon took over Yahoo, so there's no guarantees it'll continue working. But as long as we can keep fixing it and whatnot, we will we will do that. Oh, one more question. Let me um, before you go on to there. Mm -hmm. For those that don't know what the NICE is, we we. We depend a lot on volume. And while I'm thinking about that, if anybody looked at one of the tweets I put out last night, down at the bottom of the, of the graphic, 
I put one word of caution was that yesterday's market rose on decreasing volume. Uh, that didn't mean it was going to be soft today, but it was an alert that the market went higher on decreasing volume, and that is not the most positive sign you can have. What we use for volume, uh, if we're trading crude oil, uh, you know, a gold, then we use futures volume because that's all we have. But when we're trading the indexes, we are using the composite volume from the New York Stock Exchange or the nice volume because I see that is the most reliable source. So on our website, we have the volume from the New York, uh, from the NICE, the New York Stock Exchange composite. And like Jen said, you know, it, it's, we, we, we pull it from Yahoo, but you know, every now and then it gets broken and we can't control that. But if it's not broken, we will have it on our site as a service. Uh, one more question, Jim. Uh, is it possible to make a reliable, consistent monthly income from trading this method? If so, what time frame, instrument, and starting capital is the most reliable for such a fee and for an additional income of $2,000 per month? Okay. It's number one. Uh, it's – I have no way to answer that question. Learning to trade, and, and this is what we're talking about is it's not a method. It's it's a way to look and understand the markets, and it's applicable to any time frame you want to trade. The, the majority of traders, if you look at overall, I would going to guess that the overall percentage of day time frame traders that are profitable is probably less than 5%. It takes a considerable time to learn to trade. If you think about it, there is no practice court like there is when you learn to tennis and you know you go up and you can play people your own skill and ability. When you start to trade, you are trading against the best in the world the first time you ever put your order in. What we are trying to do with my experience is take you through this understanding markets so that you have a way to short circuit the law, the tremendous amount of time it would take you to stumble through this all on your own. I have no idea if you're going to be profitable or not, or, you know, what the amount of money you need to start to trade with. If you, you know, the majority of, the majority of uh, a lot of people that have trouble trading uh, is because they are undercapitalized. And then that brings in a whole nother fear is they're afraid of losing money. Uh, you, have, you have to make sound business judgments. Sound business judgments are never made when you have 100% of the information. Majority of sound business decisions are made when you have about 60% of the information. If you had 100% of the information, uh, there's really no opportunity. It's probably all gone. So I can't honestly answer the question. I can tell you that it's, it is very difficult to do. Uh, and, you know, you have, to, you have to spend some time in the markets in order to learn what the markets are about and how to trade. If you're just starting, if you're just starting today to trade, I would think the pro the the prob probability of you being profitable is probably very small. It just takes time. It just takes time to learn this stuff and put it together. Like I said, when I used to teach the, the courses, you know, uh, from a book in a sequential order, that didn't give you the real feel for the market. Then I went live on the stages. I gave you five days, but that's not enough to put it together. What we're trying to do here is give you enough time to give you a, a good opportunity to be exposed to the information you should be exposed to. Uh, once again, as we end this um, session, remember, if you're going to join us, um, your best advantage is going to be joining by uh, February 1st so that you get, you know, as much exposure as you can possibly get prior to the 26th of, of February. 
anyhow, I hope you found this a, a worthwhile uh, program this afternoon. Uh, it certainly doesn't answer all of the bias or addresses all the bias or address all the things you do to overcome them. But certainly you want to be aware of what those biases are. So once again, let me say thank you. And I hope to see you all in the very near future. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much, everybody, for attending the webinar. This webinar was rec is rec has been <laughs> recorded, and it will be available later this evening. It will be posted under the Resources tab. Go to Public Webinars, and somewhere around there you will be able to find it for your viewing at your convenience. Thank you very much, everybody.